to Victory Praise. If this is your first time, you are especially welcome, and I trust that this service will be an encouragement and a blessing to you this morning, and also those who are joining us uh, by uh, live stream on YouTube, you're very welcome uh, this morning. I'm going to open the service in prayer, and as we uh, open in prayer, we're going to um, uh, commit our time to the Lord before we have a time of worship. So let's uh, uh, pray this morning. Father, we do thank you this morning for the privilege it is to come into your presence. We thank you that you have invited us and that we are welcome to come to you to worship you. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name for your blessing upon this service. I pray, Father, that you will minister to everyone that's here uh, this morning. I pray as we worship you, as we raise our voices to you, may you, Jesus, be glorified, and may your presence come in a very real way, in a very tangible way, that you would speak into our hearts. And for everything that's done, Lord, may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So over to Rachel this morning as she's going to lead us. Amen. Good morning. I'd like to invite you to stand. I just want to read a couple of verses to you. From Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age.
Amen. You can take your seat at this point of the service. What great words we've been singing. I trust that really is our sincere prayer that we pray that God, show me who you are. Show me who you really are and fill me with your, your heart of love uh, that we would share it with those around us. Uh, before we uh, receive the morning offering uh, this morning, I want to take a few moments to do a, just a little mini teaching on giving and on the offering. I realize I haven't done this in a while, and I plan to do it for uh, a number of weeks from this uh, Sunday onwards. And um, as many of you know, that, uh, and as many of you give financially to the church as worship unto the Lord on a consistent basis, uh, weekly or monthly, and maybe many of you like Pamela and myself actually um, give 10% uh, uh, of your income, a, a tithe off the top line uh, of our income. We've done that over the years, and that's been a great blessing. I know that when the subject of money, and particularly giving and offerings, come up, many be become uneasy. And actually, sad to say, that's probably uh, due to part in the wider body of Christ Offering and giving has been an area of, of abuse, both from the pulpit, where those who have tried to uh, manipulate people to give more than it really is necessary, and also people in the pew have also tried to manipulate leaders by withholding offerings to try to influence decisions. It's been a real mess uh, in many times, but I believe our responsibility is not to shy away from it, but to teach teaches accurately from the Word of God what the Bible says, and then let you make up your own mind between you and the Lord what would be right to give in terms of offering. And let's just briefly look at the very first offering, and I have the verse up there. And one of the first offerings, it probably is the first offering, is right back to the first family, uh, Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. And uh, we know a bit about Cain and Abel, and actually in the end, uh, Cain killed his brother Abel, and it all stems from an offering. So right back from the dawn of history, there has been a contention with offerings, and it was more than just the offering, it was how that, that, Ab uh, that Cain was not, ex uh, his offering wasn't accepted by God. But we, we read in Genesis chapter four, verses three to six, it says, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And it says the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And we don't know how the Lord spoke to them, and Cain knew that the Lord was not pleased with his offering and that Abel was, ple uh, was pleased with Abel's offering. And really, this first offering, we don't know what kind of offering it was. The Bible talks in general a lot about money, possessions, and offerings. And definitely in the book of Leviticus, it talks about you know, different types of offerings. Many have taught that Cain's offering wasn't accepted because it was of the fruit of the ground and it wasn't a blood sacrifice, while Abel's offering was of the, the uh, firstborn of his flock. He was a keeper of sheep, uh, sheep, while Cain was a farmer. So, But that would really be reading into the text to say that, uh, and it wouldn't be, be right to, to bring that conclusion, but what we can conclude from the very first offerings is that, that not every offering we bring is accepted with God. We can know that from, from that text. And also, uh, something, so, so why was Abel's offering accepted and Cain's not? And the only thing really from this scripture that we could say is that Abel brought the very first, the firstborn of his flock, while it doesn't say very much about Cain's offering. They came, they brought off what they had seen produced uh, uh, of course, Cain being a farmer and Abel being a keeper of sheep. And I suppose that's where I just want to finish my little teaching this morning on that. As we think about giving to the Lord, always bring God our first. I think it's one thing that we do 
Uh, Pamela and myself do is, as soon as our wage goes in, that's almost the first payment that goes out and that we give onto the Lord. Okay, we, used to, we do it online now, but we used to bring it on the first Sunday after we were paid, bring it to, to, to the Lord. So that's something I wanted to leave with you because we need to understand that God accepts our offering and there's great blessing in blessing the, uh, an offering onto the Lord. While we as a church receive those offerings, we need to search our hearts and say, right, Lord, what is the amount that would be pleasing to you? How would what I'm given be pleasing to you? I'm just going to leave it there. I cannot, uh, we will never ask you uh, more than ask you to give. We will never come and say, why are you not given that? Uh, you know, we've heard some crazy stories in the past where people go up and say, I see you haven't given in a while and, and, and trying to get people. We will never do that. But we will teach from the word of God that God is a God who requires offerings and we need to uh, acknowledge uh, that. And we also need to acknowledge that when we give off our substance, we're acknowledging that God's our source. Could, you must, it must have been terrible for little Abel. There he was, the very first sheep that had come out. The wee fluffy, well, wet lamb and then fluffy lamb. That lamb had to be sacrificed, but it pleased God because he gave of his first. So the principle of giving of our first is in this offering. So um, uh, the ushers are free to do that. We can, uh, to, to receive the morning offering. Also, we, you can give online. There's, uh, and if you're watching online, I know actually our live stream is not on this morning. We are recording it but there's uh, some difficulties that we can't live stream, but this service is being recorded. We'll go up to YouTube later. But if you're watching online uh, there this morning, there's a QR code. So let's receive the morning offering. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Show your appreciation for the worship team. They're such a blessing to this church, and they work well together, and it's great to have their ministry. So I want to give you a few announcements at this point of the service. Uh, Reflector Youth um, is usually on, but it's not on this week, so there's no youth for the teenagers this week. Uh, the prayer meeting is on Thursday evening at 7.30, and also the One Church One Day prayer thoughts that go out should be available on the table for those who pick them, excuse me, pick them up. And then also our service next Sunday at 11 a.m. as per usual at the usual time. Always remember to come for tea, coffee, and something nice from 10.30 onwards. And then looking into March, our 25th 
uh, anniversary services here. Uh, 25 years will be in this building in Pennybridge, and um, Pastor Trevor Hill will be along uh, to uh, speak at both services on, some, on Saturday the 16th at 7, and then on Sunday the 17th at um, 11 a.m am on our Sunday morning service. Okay, that is all the announcements this morning. The kids are going out to kids club, so if you have children of primary school age, or if you're a child of primary school age, you can go out, we'll go out the single door here, and it's good to see the kids club growing, and uh, <coughs> wonderful. So let's, um, let's pray over the offering and let's pray for the rest of the service. Father, we do thank you uh, this morning for those who have given unto you uh, as an act of worship, as an offering, acknowledging that you are the source of our life, that you are the blessing, that, uh, that, that all blessings come from you. As the old hymn used to say, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And Lord, we acknowledge that you, every blessing, every good thing, even the breath in our body comes from you. It's given by you. And Father, we acknowledge that this morning. And we acknowledge that everything that we have, our finances, our possessions, they are, uh, they, we can trace them back to your goodness and to you uh, giving us uh, every good thing. And Father, so we bless those who have given this morning. May they know great blessing in their lives. And Father, as we turn to your word and as we turn uh, to say, uh, to speak your word, may you speak through uh, uh, these lips and may you speak more than even I'm saying. May your Holy Spirit minister deeply into hearts and lives this morning. We'll give you the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So this morning we're going to continue our teaching series that we've been on since the start of the year, which is entitled Godly and Gifted. Godly and Gifted, and this will be part five. So let's do a short review. Um, we've already looked at um, four of the six uh, friends, and we've described what it means to have character, to have charisma, to have compassion, uh, uh, to have courage. Last week, we looked at courage, and we said that if we are going to live godly and gifted, uh, courage is something that we need. We said that every courageous person feels fear. We said that every courageous person faces their fear, that no one has ever made a difference without courage. And we said that courage is not recklessness. That's why courage alone is not enough. It always must be accompanied by, with wisdom. So moving on this morning, and I want to introduce you to the fifth of my six friends who's helping me teach this series, and his name is Confidence. Does anybody like confidence? Confidence is a great friend. And if you miss confidence, well, your life is d very... Uh, different. So, my ne uh, so let's talk about confidence. So what exactly do we mean by confidence? What do we mean when we're talking about living godly and gifted with confidence? The Oxford English Dictionary describes confidence as the mental attitude of trusting in or relying on a person or a thing. We're talking about firm trust, reliance, and faith. So uh, the sense that I want to bring this out is, of course, as believers, as Christians, we are trusting in Christ. But out of our trust in Christ, it imparts and instills a confidence in us as we go about our day. So we're talking about a belief in the abilities of another, the trustworthiness, and relying on someone. Have you ever relied on someone and they let you down? Have you ever been waiting on someone and they didn't show up and they stood you up for whatever 
and heads nodding all over the, the building. And, but we're talking about trusting in the Lord and trusting in God because God is a God who can be trusted to keep his promises, to be faithful to us. And whenever we have confidence, whenever we have confidence, we feel, uh, we have that feeling of security, that feeling of being secure, that there's an assurance about who God is, about who we are, and what we are trying to achieve. There's a confidence, there's just a knowing deep uh, inside. So what confidence is, that's what confidence is, but what confidence is not? Sometimes people can appear to be confident, and really it's arrogance. It's uh, something that's not confidence. Uh, have you ever met someone who outwardly appears very confident, but you know inwardly they're very insecure? And uh, sometimes people can put on a good show. And actually, it's not about putting on a good show. It's about, we're talking about being confident right deep down in the very depths of our soul. Genuine confidence is not, many people have, what will we say, an overinflated ego. These gents, some ladies as well, but more gents have this sort of, they think they are someone beyond, and, 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 and it's overinflated ego. But confidence is a beautiful thing. Confidence is a wonderful thing when it comes from the depth of our being. And we know that those who try to put on a show, and even those with narcissistic traits, have you ever met someone with a, a little bit of narcissism and they're self-absorbed, and they may appear confident very outwardly, but many times that outward show is actually something they're hiding behind to actually, and, and, and there's something you can always determine that uh, between someone who is genuinely confident and genuinely values you, they want you to be confident also. But someone who has narcissistic traits, they don't want you to be confident. They appear to be confident, but they always want to have the upper hand. And that's not genuine confidence. If someone has genuine confidence, it'll spill over to you. Have you ever been with someone that's confident? And in part, you feel the confidence, the excitement, the, the, just the, the, the knowing of, of that. They, if someone is genuinely confident, they will value you. They will encourage you. They will build you up. They will cheer you on. They will impart confidence to you. Uh, this is not a, 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 a narcissism where there's this sense of a superiority and look, I'm so special this morning. Of course, I must be because you are all sudden listening to me. That's not, that's arrogance. We need to humble ourselves. Confidence is beautiful. So we're talking about confidence in the sense of our confidence is found in God, our trust is found and rooted securely in God and His promises. And as we, God wants us as believers to grow in confidence. I look back here six years ago and think of the, 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 those on the worship team that can actually lead worship now and back six years ago, there was a severe lack of confidence as there was a transition from one pastor to another pastor, and they were, uh, there were people new on the team. And, but now we can see people growing in confidence. And actually, if someone's growing in confidence and we're in church that we want to encourage each other, we should encourage each other and say, well done, you're really growing in confidence. That was good because that builds and encourages confidence. So our first verse this morning is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, verses 5, and it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. What a wonderful verse. What a wonderful promise. And it's a promise of direction, it's a promise of guidance. It's a promise that in every way that we have, there are many different paths we have in different areas of our life, and God has promised that He will direct us 
if we trust in the Lord. Now, that word trust in some translations uh, uh, reads, be confident in the Lord. Or another translation uh, reads, have confidence in the Lord. We have to have confidence in the Lord. And these verses were always verses that my mom and dad wrote on my birthday cards and Christmas cards for many years. Philip's nodding. Where's Paul? Paul's here as well. And, but it's a great verse because it's a verse of direction as you start out a new year, as you start out a new year in life. Uh, what a great promise to have that God will direct you. And many times our own understanding is not enough and we, we trust in it, and sometimes we don't trust in it. But here it says we're to lean and we're to trust and have confidence in the Lord in terms of direction to make the right decisions. Have you ever been in a place where you couldn't make up your mind, you didn't know what was the best decision? Well, here's a promise. If you acknowledge God, bring him into it and trust him, he will show you clearly what to do. You know, our life is seen many times as a journey, as a, as a journey. And have you ever been, those of us who drive, you ever go out in a dark night, maybe in the country, and you turn on the lights in the car, and you can only see a few yards down the road or a few meters down the road. Uh, you can't see very far. You can't see the full journey, even though we have Google Maps and all that stuff even though it might show us the number of minutes to get to our destination uh, and the way to go, you can't see it physically on the road. You just can see a little bit further ahead, a few yards down the road. You can't see what's around the corner. You can't see what's in every part of the journey. If there's going to be busy traffic uh, in, in, in different parts, you don't know who's going to jump out and walk across the road. Actually, Andrew and me were coming up the Ballymoney Road this week. I was bringing him back from his his uh, drumming teaching, and this guy just darted right across the road. It was you. It was you, not Sam. He doesn't know, okay? But he darted right across the road in the dark, and I didn't see him till the last minute. All these things that happened. Okay, I'll have a chat with Andrew later over lunch. Don't worry about it. Uh, but, uh, but all these unforeseen things happen to us in a journey. And it's the same way whenever we're walking with God. Sometimes we can't see very far up the road. We can't see what's round the corner. But as Christians, as believers, we are only responsible for seeing and moving forward with the light we have. Because whenever you move forward with the light you have and move into that part of life, it then qualifies you to see further ahead. And that's how God works. I remember one years ago, um, I got a, when I worked as an engineer, worked in a factory, I got a call out on a Sunday afternoon to say I needed to go in before the night shift on Sunday night. And what happened was I was speaking on the Sunday evening service. And I says, look, I can't go out, but I'm speaking tonight, but I'll go after I speak uh, the service. I'm heading across from here to Ballymena, right across to Cookstown. So when the evening service was over about what, half seven or eight o'clock, I went out and the fog was as thick. And here I'm tra having to travel. I'm tired. I've already speaking, you know, spoken. I have a call out, and I have to travel 30 miles across to Cookstown. And if you know the road, well, it's better now, the roads to Cookstown, than it was then. It's not a great road over the Rugery Road to Cookstown. And the fog was thick, and I had to slow down. And sometimes that's a bit like us and our journey of life. We think that we always have to go full pelt all the time. Sometimes you can't go full pelt and you have to slow down. Uh, so I got over, I was over there for about an hour or two, and at 11, half 11 on a Sunday night, I'm thinking, oh, I have a 30 miles to go back in the fog. And you know what? The fog had lifted. And it was clear the whole way from Cookstown back to that. Sometimes the conditions are different, but we're to trust in the Lord. What light has the Lord given you? How far do you see ahead this morning? Move forward in that light. Sometimes we hold back and think, well, until I see around the corner, 
until I see the whole journey home, I'm not going to move. No, no, move. Move with the light you got, then you'll get more light as you move forward in your journey. Trusting the Lord we're talking about. We're talking about trusting the Lord when we don't understand. So let's look this morning then at some confidence killers, and then we'll look at some confidence restorers. Confidence killers. Confidence killers. The first thought here is constant criticism kills confidence. Constant criticism kills confidence. Does anybody like to be criticized? Nobody likes to be criticized. Nobody likes that to, to, to be criticized. And I intentionally put the word constant in there, because maybe you grew up in a home where you were continually criticized, undeservingly so, and there wasn't much encouragement, there wasn't much or maybe no encouragement in your formative years. And maybe and many people that live and grow up in that atmosphere and that environment end up with low self-esteem. They feel unworthy. They feel they're not good uh, to anything. And many, maybe your parents or maybe others around you told you that you were stupid. And you know you're not stupid. There's no one that's stupid. And maybe you started to believe that. And that, direct, that was instilled into your heart and you labeled yourself as a failure. You labeled yourself as, well, I'm no good. I'm never good at anything. And criticism like that will kill your confidence. It, will, it, 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 kills the, the, it kills the vision, the gifting. It, it, it suppresses it, and it leaves you feeling vulnerable. Now, criticism in itself is not necessarily wrong. It's just how it's applied. When people use criticism to control people and to manipulate people, uh, uh, that can be, um, that's not right. And the question we want to ask is, when someone criticizes you, is that criticism warranted? Some people say, I'm not going to listen to anybody that criticizes me. That's not necessarily right either, because sometimes Criticism from other people can bring attention to little blind spots that we have, things that we're not doing well, and we can make adjustments and change. We have to, whenever we, people criticize us, we need to think, right, why are they criticizing? Is that something that they actually want to see us improve, and it would be better if they did something? Let's say on Sunday mornings, I only arrived two minutes before I was to speak my message, and I came up here, and I was totally unprepared, and I was all over the place, didn't know what I was going to be saying, and if also during the week, uh, none of you could get in contact with me, even if you left a message and never replied to it, and, uh, and you were starting to criticize me, and I said, oh, don't, uh, people are just criticizing me. You would be right to criticize me, because that's unacceptable for anybody that's a pastor or anybody that's speaking or, or doing work within the church. That would be warranted criticism. Maybe you work in an environment where the only feedback you receive is negative. I've worked in environments like that. And I've actually worked in environments where there's been praise. And actually, I worked in an environment where they actually changed from criticism over criticism to a positive working environment. And maybe you've never uh, heard the words, good job, well done, you're doing a great job in your work. That can be hard to face uh, in an employment situation. And uh, maybe you're doing a good job. Maybe you're even doing a great job and you feel undervalued. You feel not uh, uh, appreciated. And many people carry a critical spirit. Uh, 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 somebody like me, uh, you, know, you find fault easily in people. Who can find fault easily in people? All right, I'm being very honest this morning. You're all going over. <laughs> but you can find, uh, you know, and somebody comes in and somebody comes in and, and in your mind you're going, look at the state of the on. And then they come up to you. Don't, don't say you never thought that. They come up to you and you shake hands. Oh, it's lovely to see you. How much hypocrisy is that? 
But it's easy to find fault in people. It's easy to point out the hard things. And we need to be careful that we don't become the ministers of undue criticism. We need to be people uh, who uh, welcome people, and we need to value people, and we need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, not flat. The other end then is flattery, okay? Well, why we're here, flattery. Some people, oh, Pastor Stephen, what a wonderful teaching that was today. And I feel like saying, now, what point really challenged you that you're going to go home and change? But I won't go there. But some people, there's flattery. It's almost, you, you feel they're going to bow down to you. There's, a, there's a, what we say, an underlying uh, issue there. It's insincere praise. Then secondly, uh, constant criticism kills confidence, but crises and failures in our lives can kill confidence. If you ever tried something and failed, have you ever been through a traumatic situation in your life that you're still reeling from and you're struggling from? Maybe you were uh, pay, uh, sacked at a job. Maybe you've been through a divorce. Maybe your spouse was unfaithful to you. Maybe you've been through life situations, even the death of a close loved one. Or maybe you took on a responsibility. You thought you could turn the situation around and you didn't turn it around. And you feel the weight of failure on your shoulders. And sometimes, uh, and you feel like that little proverb, once bitten, twice shy. You feel, oh, I'm never going to step out into that arena again because my confidence has been killed. It's been destroyed. I lack confidence in that area, the crisis, the failure has killed your confidence. And that's why we need to be kind with people. You need to know what is going through the person that's sitting beside you. Their confidence could be at an all-time low. They could be out of failure. They could have just come out of a different situation. Be kind to each other. You don't know but uh, what has happened. And we, in these times, need to find our confidence in God. Then the third one is condemnation kills confidence. Condemnation kills condom uh, confidence. And of course, condemnation, we're talking about guilt, can be a product of crisis. It can be a product of failure. But if you have a personality like mine uh, that tends and leans towards perfectionism, anybody like me, that everything has to be perfect. You feel the weight of the world and everything on your shoulder. And the Puritans called it an overscrupulous conscience, meaning you look at every little detail of your life and thinking, am I doing good enough? We need to be free from that. And we know from the Bible that the enemy, the devil, is known as the accuser of the brethren. And that can come through other people, through undue criticism, and that can come directly where there's a, a large a cloud over our head. The Word of God says that if our heart condemns us, in 1 John 3, verse 20, if our heart condemns us, know this, God's greater than our heart. And He knows all things. In other words, let's say when we sin, we do wrong, and we need to confess it to God, and our heart feels guilty. That can be a good thing for uh, uh, not condemnation, but conviction. If our heart condemns us, God's greater than the heart, and he already knows about it. You don't inform God when you're telling him about your sin that you feel guilty about. You're not informing him. He already knows all things. But it says, if our heart does not condemn us, we have what? We have confidence before God. So confidence not only before others, but before God first is key. Having a trust, having a confidence, having an assurance, not an arrogance, not a, a, some sort of egotistical thing, but having a confidence before God. Another verse, Ephesians 3, verse 12, because of Christ and our faith in Him, we can now come boldly and what? Confidently into His presence. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of Christ's blood for us. So maybe the, the, this morning you need to leave the condemnation behind. You need to leave the guilt behind. Now, of course, if there's areas in your life 
that you know the Lord's speaking to you about uh, and you, you feel the conviction of the Spirit and you have maybe confessed but haven't left it behind and repented of, surely there can be a, a place or an open door for condemnation. But many times there are things that God has forgiven us for, forgotten about, and you still feel the guilt. You still feel the condemnation. It'll kill your confidence. We need to close all doors. As one uh, man of God in the past said, every saint has a past, a sinful past, and every sinner has a future, a godly future. And uh, I love that saying. Uh, so moving on then to the last uh, confidence killer, and here's a big one here, especially in our culture today. Comparison kills confidence. Comparison kills confidence. There will always be others who will perform better, look better, achieve better. They'll be faster, they'll be stronger, they'll be smarter, they'll have more money, they'll have more friends on Facebook, so they'll be invited to more parties, they'll know more uh, influential people, they'll be greater than you, and they'll ha seem to enjoy life better than you. There'll always be people better than you. And I just think of my own personal uh, work here, my field of study. There are Bible teachers that are more eloquent than me, there's ones that carry a stronger presence of God on their lives than me. There are ones that are more knowledgeable. Some uh, people ca can uh, read uh, the original languages of Greek and Hebrew in the Bible. There are, one, uh, there are other uh, pastors that are, love counseling. Uh, th there's other pastors that are great apologetics. That is arguing the evidence for believing in Jesus. There's other pastors who are prolific authors and maybe have written up to 100 books. And if I would compare all them great teachers with me, I would, I would kill my confidence. But you know, you need to, it's not Stephen versus all the rest of teachers. It's Stephen versus Stephen. It's, am I giving my best this Sunday morning of what I have uh, uh, to, to give? Am I given of my best. Now, of course, social media has opened up a million windows into other people's life. It has opened up, uh, and there's actually studies that they've done where social media, looking at multiple social media platforms, has increased the depression and anxiety symptoms of young people. They did a study between uh, ages 19 and 32. Severe depression or, or depression and anxiety because of excessive social media exposure. And, uh, uh, and sometimes that's just because they're comparing themselves with others. Like when someone's lying on the beach and they're showing photographs of themselves, that's not wrong to do. You're, you're letting people know I'm here away on holiday, uh, that, and you're maybe at home and you're having a hard day, and it's a tough day at the office, and then you're comparing yourself with them. And, but you know what? They've got hard days in the office. They have difficult times in their life. We only see the highlights of people. Comparison can kill your confidence. Shake off that old comparison and realize God made you special. God made you uh, someone with unique giftings. You're a unique person. You don't need to compare yourself. And I'm not the most fluent teacher. I'm not the best Bible teacher, but I've got something to give, and I'm going to give my little bit with confidence that God has put in my heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 uh, and verse 12, and the apostle Paul says, we dare not class ourselves with those who compare themselves with those who commend themselves. And, and, and during that time, there were all these apostles going around with letters of commendation and saying, here, you can have me at your church because so-and-so said I was a good teacher. And that's how, that's the context of that verse. And here, uh, and what Paul said, he says, if they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves among themselves, it's not wise. It's not wise to compare ourselves. Actually, someone once wisely says, comparison is the thief of joy. It will steal your joy when you will realize 
uh, that, um, uh, that whenever you think, oh, I'm not as good as that person. So that's the four, that's the confidence killers. And of course, we can mention many more. But let's look then about growing in confidence. If we have a lack of confidence, and let's look at God restoring our confidence in Him and in His Word. I try to start all these with the E. I don't know if it will work. But encountering God restores our confidence. There's something about God coming to us and meeting us where we are that restores our confidence in Him, but also restores our confidence in life that we can uh, function uh, and fulfill our calling. In Matthew 26, we read the story of Jesus at the Last Supper. And Jesus says at the end of his teaching at the Last Supper, see all you disciples, tonight all of you are going to stumble because I'm going to be betrayed and all of you are going to forsake me. And Peter stands up. He always seemed to be the guy that spoke first and not always wisely, uh, but he did in the later part of his life. And he says, Jesus, if all the other 11, all these other disciples forsake you, I am not going to forsake you. I'm not going to stumble. And Jesus said, see before the morning and the rooster crows, you'll have denied me three times. And Peter has insisted and said, look, even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I am never going to deny you. And with that night when Jesus was betrayed, Peter denied Jesus three times. Two young girls <laughs> came to him, and he denied. And then others came, and he started to curse and swear and saying, I don't know this Jesus of Galilee. But after the resurrection, Jesus meets Peter on the beach, and they have fish over the fire for breakfast. And Peter, who was broken, Peter, whose confidence in, in who Jesus was and, and, and in his, uh, who he thought he was and the strength that he had to be a disciple of Jesus had been completely uh, uh, destroyed, uh, had been killed. Jesus starts to minister and encounter him and says, do you love me more than these fish? He was a fisherman. And he starts to minister to him, and he starts to restore Peter's confidence in God and, in, and gives Peter a commission and un, also prophesies over Peter and says, yes, Peter, you will die someday as a martyr for me. That's who you are. And he restores Peter's confidence. And we see in the day of Pentecost, who stands up? to preach and explain the outpouring of the Spirit. A confident Peter, God restored his confidence. Embracing, second one, embracing opportunities restore our confidence. There's something about that. Have you ever tried something or something has come up and you put your hand to it, you knew God was putting it in front of you, you tried it, and it does something to your confidence because you realize, you know, I can do stuff, especially after you have been through difficult uh, crises, maybe traumatic situations. And it's all part of the healing journey of how God starts to restore us. Someone came to me over Christmas period and said, Stephen, see these last two years at church they have been a real healing journey for me. You have no idea what has gone on here. And I've given that person, that person has served in the church. They've been given responsibility. They're starting to flow in their gifting. And it's all about restoring. And maybe this morning, is there something that you know you need to be involved in? Embrace that opportunity uh, and it will restore your confidence. Because whenever we come through traumatic situations and crises, there's always that fear. If I step out again, I'm going to get bitten, beaten, and I'll maybe end me because I've had that fear. God can put opportunities in front of you that are designed to restore your confidence. That verse connected with it. 
in Proverbs 3. Don't be afraid of sudden fear or trouble from the wicked when it comes, because the Lord will be your confidence. He'll be your confidence. He will keep your foot from being taken, uh, being caught. Sometimes we have that fear. Have you ever had that fear? Oh, I'm going to get in trouble here. This is difficult. I'm going to get caught in this, and it's not going to turn out to be a blessing. God will be our confidence as we follow him. Then the third one, and actually I used the word encircling just to have the three E's um, uh, there. I should have really used the word surrounding, but E, 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 okay, embrace, um, encounter, and encircle yourself or ourselves with confident people restores your confidence. Why is that? Because confidence is contagious. Confidence is a a contagious force. Having trust, uh, it rubs off. Uh, confident people laugh a lot. Notice that. Confident people laugh a lot. Confident people are friendly. Confident people are approachable. Confident people are great to be around. And our confidence can be strengthened spending time with them because if you're truly confident, you want others to grow in confidence as well. You want others to do uh, well. It's interesting. I watch a bit of sport and then the beautiful game. It's interesting how one football team can have their heads down. Things are all against them. They're defending. They're fighting for everything. They maybe let a couple of goals in. But some just turns. One referee indecision. One wee break and they get to go forward and attack. It changes the whole momentum and their, com- their, their confidence changes. And it's interesting how sport, you, you can see it very much in sport. Could it be this morning the Lord is placing things in your life that's to boost your confidence, that to build your confidence, and to restore your confidence? Encircling ourselves with people who our confidence restores our confidence, who are confident restores our confidence, our trust. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, verse 20, he who walks with wise men will be wise. Why will he be wise? Because wise men think wisely, put their mind on wise things, they talk wisely, and they make wise decisions. And if you're in that atmosphere, even if you're foolish, you'll end up being wise. You'll end up, be careful who you listen to. But it says then, the opposite of that is, the companion of fools will be destroyed, even if you're not a fool yourself. You can end up making foolish decisions if you're in that atmosphere. In the same way, when we're in the atmosphere of confident people, God uses it to uh, boost our confidence, restore our confidence, and, uh, uh, and bring us out of uh, situations where we lack, where we lack uh, confidence. And I was talking about how, how my notes are a mess. I've lost my page. Oh, here it is here. Moved it to the wrong place. A good example of this in the Bible is the time when King David was still young and he was anointed king by Samuel, but he yet wasn't crowned king uh, as king of Israel king of Judah. And during that time, uh, between the transition between the anointing and the crowning uh, of king, David had to run away from Saul, who was God's rejected king. And as he ran away, he, he, uh, it was a very turbulent time in David's life. He was being chased by the king. Can you imagine the government after you chasing you to try to kill you? Uh, it was terrible. But during that time, he comes to this place called, uh, he lives in this cave called, it must have been quite a sizable cave, you'll know in a moment, called Adullam. And in this cave, it says that all who were distressed or in distress, all who were in debt or discontented gathered around him, that's David, and they be- he became their commander. There was about 400 men with him. So that's quite a big cave that could house 400 men. And out of this cave, these 400 men, so they were distressed, they were just discontented with life, stressed out to the max. 
They were also in debt, so they had money worries on the top of that, and they were discontented. Some other translations use the word that they were dissatisfied. Have you ever been just dissatisfied, not satisfied with things in life? And whenever they came into the presence of David, and David started to work on them and became a, 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 a leader over them, something happened to these 400 men, so much so that out of them, 400 men, came David's, what we call David's mighty men. And you can read in 2 Samuel 23, the record, the names on the record of David's mighty men, their heroic acts. So here are these men, they were distressed, they were in debt, they were discontented, and no doubt their confidence had taken a big uh, hammering, and they didn't know who they were, what they were. But whenever they came into the presence of David, that anointing that rested upon him, that anointing that rested upon him, something happened. The confidence was instilled, strength was instilled, faith was imparted. So the final verse this morning is in Hebrews. Do not throw away or cast away your confidence because it is great reward for you have need of endurance after that you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So where are you this morning? Maybe you're like Peter and you need an encounter with God to restore your confidence. Maybe there's opportunities that are up ahead that you think I should be doing that, but you're afraid. God can have them placed ahead of you to restore your confidence. And thirdly, maybe you need to be in church more often so that you can listen to those who are confidently walking this Christian life, those who have some faith, those who uh, have been on the road, who have a greater confidence and greater maturity. Amen. I mean, let's, let's have the worship team back up again. If you want prayer this morning, maybe something in this word has spoken to you and you, you think, I need my confidence restored. I need to, of course, I don't know all of you this morning, and maybe you've never placed your confidence, placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, and you wouldn't know if you passed away uh, that you would go to heaven. You can put your confidence, you can put your trust in God because he is faithful to keep his word, to keep his promises uh, to us. So if, you, if that's you, maybe you want to talk to someone at the end and, and uh, place your confidence in Jesus and ask him into your life for the first time. So the, the worship team are going to sing something as they do. If you want prayer, come up, just sit somewhere in the front uh, uh, six seats here. We will pray uh, with you uh, and we can minister to you. Uh, if you want something relating to this or maybe you're sick in your body, you just need prayer, come up, feel free, and we'll pray with you. So the worship team are going to lead us. So let's, let's worship. Just before the worship, let's, let's just pray. Father, touch hearts, touch lives, touch peoples whose confidence have been destroyed and bring back the confidence that they once knew. And even for those who have maybe in their life never experienced confidence, bring it back to your original intent in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus. 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
before we just before we close in prayer if you need Jesus just reach out to him maybe you need to talk to someone or maybe something in the message spoke to you really deeply and maybe it's almost too painful to talk about we all go through difficult situations that are too painful and you need the confidence maybe your confidence is to open up and the courage as we were talking about last week to open up and to ask the questions and to cry out for help and ask someone else. Maybe that's where you're at this morning. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your presence. We thank you that you're a God that strengthens us and we can put our trust in you, that we can live confident lives. May you continue to work in the lives of your children, restoring confidence. May we be people who step out into places where maybe we've been bitten before at your direction, Lord. And I pray, God, that you will give us the strength, that you'll give us the confidence, and that we will be people who will live confident lives knowing that you're in charge of our lives, that you have a plan for our lives. And I pray that we will be people who will be mighty, just like David's mighty men who will see great acts and great work done for your kingdom. So, Father, we just speak blessing over this congregation. For those who will be watching later uh, online, we just pray your blessing and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may it be our portion, portion both now and forevermore. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. That's our service over.